Welcome to the Wrestling Philosophy Show, where we talk to the wrestling community about their perspectives, beliefs, and techniques in the sport. In show 13, we talk with Coach Myers of the Ohio RTC in Old School Gym. He has trained the top-level guys such as Logan Stieber, Reese Humphreys, and Cal Snyder. He discusses being flexible with your workout plans and realizing there's always something to work on. He has a couple of equipment suggestions for the home and wrestling room and talks through the pillars of wrestling strength training. Go check out his ebook series too. They truly take the guesswork out of training and how to get your athlete to peak at the right time. You can find this video show and past episodes on YouTube, or if you're more of the audio type, head over to your favorite podcast platforms. So, so here we are tonight with uh, Coach Dustin Myers of Old School Gym. How are you doing tonight? Hey, I'm feeling good, man. Just actually finished up with uh, my team gut check groups. I had my elite high school group at 3.30, and then my 4.30 and 5.30 groups are kind of like a mix of you know middle school and high school. We even got a few youth kids thrown in there. So it's been absolute pandemonium here at Old School Gym for the last you know three and a half hours. So now I kind of got a moment to decompress sit down, chop it up with you. But, you know, for all intents and purposes, my day is done. I'm on smooth sailing now. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. So give us our, uh, our listeners um, that don't know you, which I don't know how they don't, but a quick rundown of how you got into wrestling and, and where you're at now. All right. So, <clears throat> um, well, as you mentioned already, I'm the owner of the old school gym here at Potassal. We're just east of Columbus. I'm also the strength coach for the Ohio Regional Training Center, the Ohio RTC at the Ohio State University. So any of you that may not be completely familiar with what the ROTC is, or if you've called it the ROTC, which is, you know, branch of the <laughs> Army, but it's something totally different. The RTC is kind of the Olympic arm of the wrestling program at Ohio State. You know, and back in the day when, uh, you know, Tommy Rollins and a couple other guys first started, it was just called the Buckeye Wrestling Club, you know, just like that, the Hawkeye Wrestling Club and things like that. But um, Ohio State's compliance said so they wanted a clear line between the RTC and the college athletes. So that's why they changed the name from the Buckeye Wrestling Club to the RTC. So the reason I bring that up is that it almost makes it kind of easier, easier to understand if you think, all right, this is just kind of the Olympic program that's attached to our wrestling program at the Ohio State. You know, training in the right. same room, a bunch of overlap between the coaches. You know, Travell Delagnev, who's our you know, main assistant for the Buckeyes, he's the head coach of the of the RTC and Logan's the assistant for the RTC. So anyway, I'm the weightlifting guy for the RTC. I don't wrestle with those guys, even though I was a wrestler when I was younger, but compared to what these guys do, it's, you know, a night and day difference. So I don't get on the mats with them, but I run with them, lift with them, all that good stuff. Um, I grew up, I wrestled in, in high school, you know, just kind of a late starter. So just wrestling in high school. But um, I think even just wrestling those, you know, a few years in high school really gave me a lot of love and appreciation of the, to the sport and also really kind of changed who I was as an individual. You know, I, I know a guy like, like you came from a wrestling family, right, Jared? Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. My dad. So you uncle. Guys like, yeah. From, so from day one, it was like, that was the culture mm -hmm. in your household was wrestling, you know, mm -hmm. whereas with myself, you know, I didn't grow up in a wrestling family. So when I get introduced to that world, I felt like it really changed a lot of things about me, you know, kind of maybe my work ethic helped kind of bring out uh, some toughness that maybe I thought was there, but wasn't there until I got on the, on the mat with my buddies and they're beating up on me, you know? So I think um, that's one of the great things about the sport is whether, you know, you do it your whole life and you come from a family, a long line of elite wrestlers like yourself or someone like me that starts, a, you know, starts in late in life, it can still have a huge impact on who you are as a person um, and the, the type of things you expect out of yourself, you know? So I know I'm kind of getting sidetracked there, oh, you're but good. You're good. Yeah, so that's that's my wrestling story. You know, I okay. I'll, I'll get on you know podcasts a lot, and guys will say, oh, "All right, so give me tell us you know your wrestling uh, your resume." I'm like, "Well, dude, I don't got a resume. I wrestled three years at Edison High School, you know." So, right. you know, just just your average high school wrestler, and now I've just kind of been lucky enough to put myself in a position to be around the sport at the highest level and work with some really cool athletes. Right. So you touched on some names earlier, and you just mentioned high level athletes and. You know, as a coach, you know, you build these new athletes up and eventually they move on. And, the, you know, how do you keep in touch? Obviously, you know, in today's technology, but, you know, how do you, you know, what do you tell yourself when, you know, you're coaching top level guys and they're moving on to coach elsewhere or compete elsewhere? You know, what are some of the conversations you have with yourself? Because, you know, those are some deep relationships, especially in the field of, you know, training them and then they move on. Well, I think it's just like anything where as a coach, um, 
and maybe, you know, obviously it's a little bit different as a wrestling coach. You know, I only do, you know, I'm handling their strength conditioning. So for me, it's my whole world, but for them, it's a very small part of what they do and what they're focused on. But I think anytime you're in a coaching situation or even like as a parent, your ultimate goal is for then for your kids, or your athletes to move on and be able to do their own thing and become successful, you know? So we'll use, you know, Reese Humphrey as, as an example, you know, he was really one of the athletes on the RTC that, you know, me and him really kind of bonded well, we trained well together, you know, he made three world teams while we were working together. Really, we became best friends, you know, we're, our, our wives were like the, you know, kind of in that same stage of motherhood, our kids were the same age. It was like his wife's from Sandusky, you know? Yeah, his wife's from Sandusky, <laughs> yeah. exactly. So, yeah. Uh, you know, so Reese, so Reese was a guy, you know, came very close. I mean, we'd go out together all the time. You know, right. cookouts with the family, stuff like that. I'm like, man, this is a guy I'll be friends with the rest of my life. Well, then, obviously, for him to kind of grow within his career, he had to move on. You know, so he went out to California, coached for a while with the uh, Tide Mercury, and now, right. you know, he's on the on the East Coast. You know, he was just you know freestyle coach of the year. You know, in the second year, running his own RTC there. So I think that's one of those things where obviously I was sad to see him go, but I knew for him, the next thing after competing was coaching and for him to kind of take that next step in his career, he had to go. Right? right. So as much as I miss training with him, I wouldn't have wanted him to stay around just so right. I can work out with him. You know right. what I mean? It's like, right. so it's one of those things where him and I are still really close. We talk on the phone all the time. We still got projects we're collaborating on. We got a, an ebook, how to become a freak athlete. It's going to be out here in the next month or two. We've been working oh, cool. on it for about a year. So I think, you know, the key in anything is forming, you know, lasting relationships. You know, I'm not nice to an athlete because they're my athlete and because I'm training them. You know, I get to know the, them as a person. I want to help them. You know, any, think of any coach you've had that had a big impact on you. They took an interest in you as a person, not just as, you know, Jared Opfer, the wrestler. The, mm -hmm. You know, the, they weren't just trying to help you win another state title. They were trying to help you grow as a person. So I think mm -hmm. when, you're, when you approach coaching that way, you form friendships and it, not every athlete, you're going to hit it off like that. Some of them, you know, it might be more strictly of a business relationship, but the ones that you become close with and you, you pour a lot into them and they trust you, you know, those, those I think those friendships last a lifetime. You know, my high school coach, uh, Doug Knight, he still coaches in, uh, in uh, back, back around Stoomville where I'm from. He coaches in Indian Creek, kind of a neighboring school. Him and I still talk on a regular basis. And he was only my coach for one year. You know, my guy, mm -hmm. Smitty, who... You, oh, yeah. you know real well. Oh, yeah. he, he just stopped by a couple weeks ago. He's up this way. I and mean, Cooper <laughs> stopped through. Uh, they're here uh, all day. Good dude. Go ahead. Yeah, so those are guys that, you know, mm -hmm. you know, Smitty was kind of like an older brother to me in the wrestling room. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he kind of helped out the team maybe one year or whatever. So from a coaching aspect, you know, it wasn't like we were involved for 10 years or anything, but we're still close. And this is, you know, 25 years later. We still talk on the phone. I still work with his son, Cooper, and, mm -hmm. you know, all that good stuff. So I think – you form these relationships and then distance doesn't really matter over time. You know, we have, we have our iPhones, we have social media to kind of right. passively stay in contact. And then when you have the time to make time, you do it. Yeah. Was there a certain point you knew you wanted to get into coaching or just kind of fell naturally into it? Um, well, I'll tell you, I, you know, I was obviously, you know, when I started personal training, you know, I, I look at personal training and coaching as two different things. You know, I used to always mm -hmm. say, well, I'm a personal trainer. Well, now I don't even really, you know, I'm not a trainer anymore. I'm a coach. And I think that even when I was personal training people just for kind of general fitness or weight loss or bodybuilding or whatever, my personality was kind of more coach, you know, just kind of mm -hmm. the way I approach things. And um, I started to kind of become drawn towards training athletes, especially training wrestlers, because, you know, I felt like sometimes in the personal training world, it was someone was paying me to have someone to come and make them do something. And they wanted just someone to complain to and, I mean, I know it's going to sound terrible to say like I'm bashing the industry. Or something, no, but no, I know what you're saying. Yeah, it, it didn't feel very fulfilling to me. I was like, man, am I even helping this person? You know, they they come in and work hard, you know, two days a week while they're here with me, but the other days they're not doing anything, and they just it's the same thing. It's a groundhog day, right? Mm -hmm. But the athletes that are working towards a, that have a concrete goal they're working towards, like I felt like when I'm putting something into them, and then they're going on and having some type of growth, achieving something. I'm like. Now I'm getting something in return. You know, it's like I've, I'm feeling that sort of satisfaction from helping someone. Whereas in the personal training world, I didn't, I didn't quite feel that same thing. And that's, that's not to say that all my clients were like that, but just kind of in general. So I, th I was definitely, once I got my feet wet and got a handle on personal training, I was definitely more drawn towards training athletes for sure. Gotcha. Do you think you uh, just gravitated towards wrestling since you had the background and your upbringing? You know, you what, just came out with the 
the blue car blue collar strength training you know is it kind of just you liked working with those type of people i think it was a little bit of both of the sport too yeah well i think you know even though after high school i was out of the wrestling world i was still a fan of the sport you know i'm okay. still watching okay. the NCAA boys and you know still good at some dual meets so i'm still kind of around it a little bit you know as a fan and then obviously once you know my even like we talked about even though i wrestled for a few years i think that coupled with my blue collar upbringing you know i mean I had the mindset of a wrestler. So when mm -hmm. I would train these high school wrestlers, I'm like, all right, I identify with these guys more. I can, I can push these guys. I kind of was just kind of drawn to that type of athlete in general. And I think just even having a small background in the sport would allow me to have a better understanding of the strength needs of the sport. Right. You know, or like what, you know, what it, yeah, I always say, if you haven't put your foot on the line in something, it's, not, it's hard to really understand what that feels like, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, I grew up boxing, you know, hitting the heavy bag and stuff. But until I started sparring in my 20s, you don't really know what boxing feels like until someone's actually punching you in the face. Right. You right. might think you know how to box, but you really don't. You know, just being able to throw a punch and hit the heavy bag, that's not boxing. Right. So I think kind of the same thing with wrestling. You know, even when I was really young in my career, there was probably a lot of area coaches who may have been you know, quote unquote, you know, smarter than me, or they had, you know, maybe their degree was an exercise phys, or they had a higher level certification, or they could just, you know, big word people to death. So on paper, they might know more than me. But if, if you've never had a singlet on and put your foot on the line and know what it feels like to be dead tired when someone's clubbing you in the head, mm -hmm. in my mind, you can't really understand how to train someone for that sport. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I never played football. I've trained football players. And I feel like I've done a good job with it. But I think someone with my training knowledge that has also been a football player would do a better job because they're going to understand the way it feels out there. Mm -hmm. So, um, again, I know I'm off on a tangent there. No, but you're good. No, you're good. It's funny you bring up boxing and, uh, you know, and I never really thought of my first sport memory, but I, um, you sent a tweet out a while back. I, I forget what, what uh, boxing match Hagler maybe. And I was like, oh, man, I that is my it. first memory is my dad at our, sit in the living room watching boxing and my dad had you know my brother drew or you know grew up pretty two years apart and same size he had his box and he has videos of us boxing each other when we're little and uh you know that old school uh blue collar work ethic being down in the basement the house he had a his own pulley system in the basement and uh oh yeah he put us on there and do his pull downs you know we were the weight and uh it's kind of funny <laughs> this was back in the 80s you know what i mean so you oh, know, yeah. looking back um it was just kind of cool and a lot, a lot of stuff you you know, do with your, your son and family. It's like, man, it, it sparked a lot of memories, but I'm um, sorry. I'm getting off on a tangent now, but. Um, no, that's good. I, I love hearing stuff like that because, you know, you look at, you know, you think of those things when you're a child as like, well, it's just normal. It's just, my dad just has a pulley system in the basement. And that's just right. part of what we do. So it becomes just normal, the hard work that you guys did. And that mm -hmm. carried over into your wrestling career. It's so much easier to take someone who grows up around something, whether it's weightlifting whether it's wrestling, whether it's, you know, physical work, carrying bricks, stacking firewood, whatever it is, when someone grows up around things like that, then everything in life just kind of becomes easier because, all well, this is just the way things are done. You know, you and, you and Drew probably learned, like, all right, well, you guys are mad at each other, so now you got to put on the gloves and you got to duke it out or you got to go to the living room and wrestle each other. Right. That's how you handle your problems rather than, you know, letting it fester inside and just be mad. You guys would handle it. Right. So no, 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 I, I love hearing stories like that. I can, I could talk about those things all day. Yeah. yeah. Um, one other thing, you know, not to bash, but once what's one thing you hear, you know, coaches or coaches in your field giving recommendations that you disagree with? Oh man. You talk, so talk strictly about strength coaches. Yeah. Strength coaches as it relates to wrestling, you know? Yeah. So I think, I think probably an important thing for, you know, whether it's strength coaches or whether it's the high school coaches that are running the strength plan or whatever is, well, a couple things. Number one is remember, there's multiple ways to accomplish the same goal. And I'll use, I'll use Olympic lifting or hand cleans as an example, because I always get questions from coaches. They'll say, hey, coach, we see you don't do hand cleans. We do hand cleans for our guys to build explosion, to build power. I'll say, okay, well, are you an expert at teaching Olympic lifting? Oh, well, no, my football coach had me do them 20 years ago. Okay, well, you probably shouldn't be teaching a skill movement, you know, Olympic lifting is its own Olympic sport. And that just because I don't do them doesn't mean that I don't think there's value in them. It's mm -hmm. because I am not an expert at teaching them. 
And in my mind, the risk for versus reward is not there unless you can develop the athletes into very proficient Olympic lifters. I used to use Olympic lifting. Even my first year or two at Ohio State, I would try to have the guys do hand cleans or whatever, and it would turn into like this meathead session of us, you know, power reverse curling the bar, and guys are hurting their shoulders. I said, you know what? There got to be a better way that requires kind of a, like a lower entry level skill wise. So that's when we started doing more weighted jumps, more sled work and things like that. And so I think a lot of maybe earlier on in my career, a lot of ideas I had like, well, all right, if we want to get, if we want to build explosion, we got to do hand cleans. Or if we want to do, we want to get our deadlift better. We have to do it this way or whatever it is. I, I thought very concrete. And you see that a lot from experts in the fitness world. You know, if someone's a CrossFit guy, they think CrossFit is it. If someone's a powerlifting guy, they, you have to follow the West Side Barbell methods. It's only powerlifting, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think the biggest thing you can do, or probably the best thing you can do as a strength coach is realize there's many paths to get wherever you're trying to go, where you're trying to take these athletes. You can't be so stuck on whatever it is that you like to do that you try to fit everyone into that, that mold. You have to find what's going to work best for the athletes. Now, that can still work within the framework of what you value and what you like to do, but you have to know not everyone can get to where they're going the same way. Gotcha. Gotcha. No, that makes sense. <laughs> um, I guess, um, what do you say to a past athlete or parent that, you know, that wants to be healthy and just don't know where to start? Or, you know, past athlete, you know, they want to get in the gym and do something. Um, you know, what do you say to them? Do you have that well, question come up? Yeah, yeah. I hear, I hear that a lot from people, especially, and honestly, a lot of times it's more so the higher level athletes. Okay. You know, the kids that were two or three times state champs in high school, or even the guys that go on and wrestle in college, mm -hmm. because they're so used to having this lofty goal in this you know, training cycle the last year round that really is propelling them towards it, that when it's over, when, hey, my college eligibility is done, or you know, whenever you know, I graduate high school and now I'm not competing anymore, if they didn't develop a love for training just for the sake of training, it's easy for them to go to, from this huge workload to they don't do anything. Mm -hmm. And now they're like, oh, man, it's been five years since I graduated college. You know, I wrestled my last match. And I haven't done anything since. So it's actually really common with, with elite athletes. And what I tell them is, regardless of whether it's an elite athlete or just someone who mm -hmm. is just out of shape, and out of why I said, all you – it can become overwhelming when you start thinking about, number one, where you used to be, how far you fell, and how much work it's going to take to get back to where you're going. Mm -hmm. So you really need to worry about two things, and that's what are you going to do today and what's your plan for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And if you can just focus on those two things and then just, you know, rinse and repeat over and over and over again, mm -hmm. you'll be good. Yeah, that's so I always uh, tell people, the first day they come to the gym, when they go to leave, I, I say, hey, what time are you coming in tomorrow? And if they hesitate or they say, I don't know, I'll say, hey, you've got to fix that right now. You already got to know, hey, I'm coming in tomorrow, 5.30 a.m. Okay, what are you working? All right, I'm going to do conditioning tomorrow. Whatever it is, you have, to, you have to know what tomorrow is, and you've got to be able to check the box and know you did it today. Right. I mean, you see that a lot, you know, past wrestlers. Oh, you know, my, you hear, oh, my metabolism screwed up from all the weight cutting. Or, you know, they make excuses. And, you know, they hear, I need to get back in shape. I need to get in shape or do this and do that. And, uh you know, going back to my dad, one tip he always had, he's like, I, I jump on the scale every morning and that, that's my guide, you know, and I know if, you know, and he's a pretty good shape for his age and everyone's like, man, your, your dad's in good shape. And then that's something I always took with me, you know, that, that scale doesn't lie. You know, if you're, you're wanting to stay lean and trim, you know, if that's your goal, you know, obviously you have other goals. Right. That's something I took away from that. Um, one topic you touched on um, a little bit ago was recovery. You know, a lot of people think, oh, I need a day off or this or that. And, you know, they're not training that hard. They don't need the recovery. I guess, you know, what's your tips or your take on recovery? Well, you know, I, I used to always say overtraining is a myth. Okay. And I, I still believe that's true to an extent in that I think it's impossible for you to be so overtrained that you can't do anything or that you need a day off to lay around the couch and watch TV. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, it is possible to, become, you know, to start overreaching and become overtrained from the standpoint of, hey, I need a break from the intensity. Mm -hmm. But there's always something that you can do. You know, there's days, you know, I'm, I'm 41 years old. There's days where my body feels beat up, but I never take a day off from training. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so if I, if maybe let's say if I had a hard run, you know, plan for tomorrow, but I wake up and my Achilles really bother me, my hamstrings are sore. I might say, all right, you know what? I need to loosen them up. I'm just going to 
I'm going to go for a nice bike ride, or maybe I'll do some, you know, light weights, or I'll do yoga, or maybe I'll, you know, do just some, uh, some calisthenics and then get in the sauna or whatever it is. So you have to, you have to be willing to be flexible with your plan, number one. And number two, you have to realize there's always something you can work on. So like with my high school kids, for example, you know, if they're feeling, you know, beat up, they'll say, oh, I don't think I'm going to take tomorrow off, coach. I'll say, all right, well, here's what I want you to do. I want you to work on your prehab, you know, work on our flexibility. You know, I mean, oh, you, you feel beat up, your legs are sore, you know, why don't you jump, jump on the aerodyne? It doesn't mean we got to do a hard aerodyne workout, but let's at least get a sweat, get our heart rate up. You know, it'll help kind of, you know, maybe filter out some of the toxins in your body, get your metabolism going, make you feel good. So I'm a big believer in doing something physical every day. And I've been doing that so long that even if I wait till like noon or the early afternoon to do something, my body feels completely out of whack. And I feel like almost like, Oh, I only did one workout today. And I wait till the afternoon. I haven't done anything. It's and like get a weird, yeah. weird yeah. thing. <laughs> yeah. uh, if uh, people are asking uh, one piece of equipment to get for the home under a hundred dollars for, for wrestling, what would you recommend? Oh man, I'm going to have to go with a pull-up bar. Okay. It's kind of the most simplest thing. So if you don't have a pull-up bar, like if you're not going to buy any weights, if you have no equipment, and especially for, let's say your parents of youth wrestlers out there, mm -hmm. the one piece of equipment you need is either pull-up bar or a climbing rope because just about everything else we can replicate using body weight and no equipment. You know, so for our lower body, you know, we can do glute bridges, we can do mm -hmm. split squats, we can do lunges, you know, we can do, they can do box jumps up onto the couch if they need to. You know, we can do all kinds of push-up variations and handstand push-ups and planks and things for the core. But unless you have a pull-up bar, it's going to be really hard to work your lats and your grip and those pulling muscles. So I think, you know, whether you build one or whether you buy a cheap one, every home should have a pull-up bar. Okay. Now, for a coach, you know, what's the best over $500 purchase for their wrestling? Oh, I'm glad you teed that up for me right there. So <laughs> every, every, every wrestling room probably already has a pull-up bar and hopefully climbing ropes as well. Uh, but what do you have in that room to build power, explosion, and also work the endurance? For your lower body, you need a wrestling sled. So full disclosure, the wrestling sled is my product that we came out with that is a sled developed specifically for the mats. And I get, you know, a lot of times people will say, oh, well, how is this different from the shot sled? Because maybe they've seen, seen the shot sled. And for what I, and I, I don't pay a lot of attention to other companies, but what I have seen of the shot sled, it seems to be more of a device you use to drill wrestling moves or wrestling specific positions. With the wrestling sled, I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel here, or I'm not trying to, you know, have you do something that you could actually use a wrestling partner for, like practicing your double leg or practicing your shot. What we're doing is taking proven strength conditioning methods that powerlifting and you know, athletic coaches have been using for decades, whether it's on the football field or in the gym, and just be able to use that in the wrestling room and it's safe to use on the mat. So we do you know, pushing, pulling, dragging, you know, rowing, tug of war, all these different protocols right there in the wrestling room. Cool. And they can find that right on your website, Old School Gym. Is that yep. on there? Old school, okay. OldSchoolGym.com. And we might even have a page for WrestlingSled.com. I'm not sure. Oh, cool. But either way, if you go to, if you go to OldSchoolGym.com, right. click on the Wrestling Sled to, Wrestling Sled tab, and there it is. Cool. Um, I guess while we're on it, I guess for those living under a rock, I guess what's some of the other products you offer? So in addition to the Wrestling Sled, you know, probably the way I've been able to impact coaches the most is by sharing my knowledge and my programming that I use with not just my high school athletes, but that I use with the Buckeyes and I use my senior level athletes at the RTC. And that's through my wrestling strength conditioning or strength conditioning for wrestling ebook series. Um, so I started it about four or five years ago. Uh, the books are used not just by top, you know, even D1 programs here in the United States, but they're used by, you know, wrestling clubs all over the world. I mean, I'm talking Russia, Greece, Mongolia, you name it there's a coach somewhere that is using my strength conditioning for wrestling ebook series. I have ones that are specifically to use at home. So for kids that don't have access to a gym, this is especially helpful during COVID. Um, I have, you know, kind of my elite programs, which are up to their volume two now at preseason, in season and off season editions of that. And then I also have, um, I have other ebooks too. I have ones you know, specifically for conditioning. I have my blue collar strength ebook that you just mentioned. And some other programs, you know, for the coaches out there that are trying to get back in shape and kind of get that beer gut off a 20-day shred. Um, what I try to do in those ebooks, 
is I'm not just giving you the workouts and saying, hey, here's a sheet, here's the workout to follow. I try to give you, you know, all the keys so that you understand why you're doing things at certain times of the year. There's an exercise library that shows you exactly how to do the form so there's no guesswork um, because I want to educate you as well, not right. just teach you what to do, but specifically right. how to do it. The nutrition tips right there, the cocoa, cardio. Yeah, there's nutrition there, tips right? in there for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, and even there, there's a kid's version, right? The coops and that. Right? Oh, yeah. So all ages, yeah, I mean, all ages, right? Yeah, um, so the youth version, which I, I believe you can get at the OAC website, correct? Yeah, that's yeah, that's right. Yeah, yep. <laughs> So okay. if you want to get my, my strength conditioning for youth wrestling, go to the OAC website and make sure to pick that up. And something I did with the, um, with the youth version is I actually did video links for every one of the exercises in the exercise library. So you can click on a takes through YouTube video of myself with Cooper Smith mm -hmm. from a couple of years ago. And uh, so that way you can actually see me having a youth athlete demonstrated. And I'm, rather than me demonstrating the movement, I'm actually coaching the youth athlete, showing you what cues, like, okay, Right now in this movement, he got to make sure his hips come back. He's staying braced. His chest, his chest is up. You know, yada yada yada. So I cannot emphasize enough whether you're a coach or whether you're a parent. These things will totally change the way that you're able to help your athletes and the way that you're able to coach them in the weight room. So, what's the sled story then? Just you know, get, get, getting back to that is just there's no product you guys had at Ohio State, and you're like, you know what, I'm going to make this myself. Obviously, you have an entrep entrepreneurial mind. Is that how it came about? So, you know, I can't take a credit for the original design. I think Alex Picasso, oh, okay. who you know Alex, of course. So Alex yeah, he wrestled was, one of our St. Mary's guys, I believe, in the, in the state tournament. Oh, he was, oh. Alex was a, was a beast. Probably one of, the, one of the most physically gifted guys I've ever worked out Jump out of a pool, right? With, I remember seeing vi videos right. or something, jump out of a pool. Right. It's un unbelievable the stuff that he could do. I saw him one time do a chin-up, or it might have been like a set of two or three, holding Nathan Tomasello between his legs. He had him like scissor between his legs. So NATO at the time probably weighed 130 pounds. And it's one thing to do chin-ups with 130 pounds of plates hanging from your waist, but he was actually holding with his hamstrings a live human being. In the way. So like, yeah, Picasso was just an unbelievable freak of nature. It was a lot of fun. He was actually the first person I ever ran C-deck with. Oh, wow. um, so anyway, so me and Picasso used to have some great workouts, but he had had the concept for it because he was a fan of sled work because he'd come from a background of doing – uh, strongman competing when he was in high school okay. so he was familiar with all this sled protocol he's like you know we have sleds that we can use over French field house but you know it is once you get into the season the logistics of saying like all right we're going to drive five minutes away to go right. do a workout like, it just doesn't, not doesn't make sense yeah mm -hmm. no it makes no sense even if you had him to take outside you're not doing that in February so mm -hmm. he had someone you know kind of fabricate some prototypes for us and we had five or six of kind of the original the first version of it down there that we used at the RTC and immediately, because I'd already used sleds a lot here at the gym, um, they immediately was, you know, a big part of my training with the Buckeyes. I always say it was my secret weapon with the Buckeyes, you know. Uh, we use it, you know, year-round. At certain times, we were doing them super heavy for strength. Other times, we were, you know, once we got in the season, we are doing them for more for speed, and then a little bit later on, a little bit more for endurance. Um, but that was where the original prototype came from. And then uh, myself and Corey G and my other partner at that grant, uh, we ended up hooking up with a fabricator right here in Columbus on the on the south end, and they have a shop down there. And so if you order a wrestling sled, it gets made right here in Columbus. Nice. Uh, the carpet comes from Smitty's Carpet Warehouse. Oh, does coach. it really? That's cool. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Smitty has a guy that hand hand stitches the uh, carpet for us, puts the seams on it, it and everything. Jeb? So. Jeb? Is it Jeb? Do you know? Uh, so it was Jeb. Jeb actually right, Jeb. That's right. He did. That's right. Yeah, so Jeb was his right-hand man for a right. long time. Yeah. It, Kind of, kind of funny story. So Jeb was, um, you know, a few years younger than me. I think he was maybe in eighth grade when I was a senior. So we never ended up wrestling together. And um, he, so then he would have been a freshman. Yeah, right after I graduated. Or maybe, I, don't, I can't remember the timing of it. But he was in high school when I was gone. But he was his, um, his coach. My last open tournament I ever wrestled was my first year here at Ohio State. There was an open up at like Mary and Elgin or somewhere. Okay. And me and my old drill partner, Luke Spencer, who lived together at the time. Oh, yeah. This was right before he left to wrestle Greco for the Army. He talked me into going up there and wrestling an open. And sure enough, first match, I drew Jeb Benoski. <sighs> He's still in high school, but was wrestling the open division right. at my high school. So, Jeb, if you're listening, I still have that 8-2 to two win over you. I mean, uh, I know you were gold and I was 19, and you ended up becoming a stud, and I'm just some old guy. But 
that was maybe one of my last matches ever, you know, 20 <sighs> Two or 23 years ago. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. Yeah, Jeb's usually the guy, uh, you know, at the OEC State Tournament delivering the, the carpet. You know, we lined the whole Cavelli Arena and all that, everything. So, yeah, Jeb's, yep. a, Jeb's a good dude. He's always telling me oh, stories. Smitty's like, you got to say this to him, you know, bust his chops. <laughs> but, um, um, that's awesome, using Smitty's carpet. That's, that's cool. That's cool. Um, yeah, I, I, the, the cool thing about being in business as long as we have is that, We've got along the way, we've got to meet a lot of other entrepreneurs and, mm -hmm. you know, some of them like, you know, a guy like Smitty, I mean, I've known him my whole life, but even other guys you run into and you meet guys and you may not have a way for you to you know, match up and collaborate right away, but it might be 10 years from now, right. there might be some way that you can partner up with someone. So I think the more times that you can do business with people you're familiar with and your friends with, you hear people say, well, don't mix friends and business. I think that's bullshit. I think you should mm -hmm. always do business with people that you like and respect. And you just have to make sure that you do business the right way. And then they're, right. they're always going to like you and respect you, you know? Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And that's funny. Uh, going back to Smitty, the first time I visited yeah. him, uh, you know, when he lived, you know, above the carpet shop and, uh, oh, yeah. little, so my, my dad actually, you talk, I talked about the blue collar upbringing. He owned a carpet store, owns a carpet store blind. They do carpet and blinds. And we, and we grew up above, above the carpet store, just like Smitty. So it's kind of, Funny how Dude, it keeps getting, the layers keep getting more. Well, and more, well then I'm sure you heard this story too. Smitty loved this story. He uh, he cost St. Mary's a state title back in the day. He had beaten a guy at the state finals, and Smitty's coach, uh, Scott Heemstra, and then his brother uh -huh. was my coach, Mark Heemstra. So they had a battle, and Smitty had a big upset over a you know projected state champ on our team. So that cost us a, a state title. And the two brothers, I guess, you know, there's some you know some some bad blood there for a minute because the brothers you know caught you know oh, yeah long story but yeah well I, I bet i bet i think he has told me that story before but i bet you he loves to bring it up anytime he talks to you oh, oh yeah or, oh yeah or, every time every time yeah, yeah. Or, or anytime he the heemster brothers are around each other i'm sure it comes yeah. up you know you'd have one more banner if one for me oh smitty <laughs> um so i know you do uh you kind of have milestones right but every birthday you run a 400 for time. Do you have any yeah. uh, upcoming milestones or anything you're working towards or want to work towards? Well, I mean, you know, my original thing was, you know, I think when I was, when I was at 33 or 34 was I started running the 400 on my birthday. And cause I'd always, you know, I wanted to see if I could get under a minute and it took me a couple of years before I could finally do it. I think maybe the third year I finally clap, you know, cracked that sub 60 mark. So at that time I was 36. And then I remember thinking like, all right, I wonder if I can keep this streak going until I, until I turn 40. Mm -hmm. And this year at 41, I've hit it every year since. And this year at 41, I, I set a new PR. Um, so thankfully I had Colin Moore to run against me. I, I always got to have someone who's a really good runner to, to challenge right. me on. Right. But um, now, you know, as far as that's concerned, I want to see how long can I keep that streak going? Mm -hmm. Can I still run a sub 6,400 when I turn 50? I don't know. Maybe my body will give out before then. You know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think as long as I keep living my life the way I am now, I'll be able to do it. Um, as far as other things, you know, I was going to do another triathlon this year, but then with COVID, a lot of them got canceled. So I did a, an Olympic triathlon last year, which is like you have Ironman, half mm -hmm. Ironman, third Ironman, then Olympic, then you have like some lower distance. So the distances keep getting chopped down. So my next goal was then to do a third of an Ironman and just kind of keep going up from there. Gotcha. Uh, you know, maybe run a marathon, you know, maybe, yeah. whatever. But if, I think that's a, a big piece of it, right? Having goals, you know, for those, you know, ex-athletes, okay, here's my goal this time, you know, or here's, you know, such and such date, I want to do this, you know, just, you know, to live that high, healthy lifestyle, you know, so. Yeah, it, it, it places more of a, an importance and a sense of urgency on like the little things, mm -hmm. you know, like if you know, like, all right, I'm, even if it's, hey, I'm running in my neighborhood 5K next month, you're not going to miss a workout. You might think twice about having, you know, an extra five beers on Friday night because you mm -hmm. think, oh, do I want to, and I'm going to miss my run tomorrow. You know, our 5K is only a couple weeks away. So I don't care. It don't have to be something grand. It don't have to be an yeah. Ironman triathlon. You don't have to go to the track on your birthday. It could be something as simple as, hey, I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to, you know, max out on the big three lifts on, you know, the first of the month or whatever it is, mm -hmm. you know, I think, I think just having those little goals is, uh, is very important. You know, my partner, Corey G, he just turned 42 last week. Right. His big goal is he wanted to be able to dunk on his birthday. Right. He, right. Along, he saw that. So, yep. um, 
we, we kind of talked about afterwards, like, man, like we're, we're, you know, we're in our forties and we're still setting these goals of things we've either, you know, never done or we haven't done in 20 years. And, you know, something he's doing, you know, he was a, a basketball player growing up. So it's kind of related to that sport he, he did. You know, a lot of the stuff that I do is tied to wrestling. So even though, you know, we were, you know, quote unquote athletes 25 years ago, it still kind of gives you that feeling of, you know, competition. And there's still times where if I have a scheduled track workout with my RTC guys or whatever, like I, I still get the butterflies. I wake up mm -hmm. and it's like, I might even have a little bit of like nervous diarrhea because it's like, man, it's <laughs> right. today's a day we're going to the track. You know, this yeah. is serious, it's not just another workout. So yeah, for any of you guys out there listening, if you can find the, this little thing that'll help you kind of get that same feeling because once we stop competing, we lose that, mm -hmm. you know? We right. lose those nerves, and those nerves are a good thing. Yeah, that that's definitely – that's a, had a wrestling mindset on recently, and, you know, we talked about that a little bit, you know. Which, we're talking which off guy did that What's that? Which guy did it from uh, mindset? Did you uh, Jay Conner. So, okay. Yeah, so um, – so yeah, so um you have anything else for us? Do you have anything else? Oh man, let's see. Well, I know we touched on earlier, you asked about what you know, what do I feel like a lot of coaches maybe in my profession do mm -hmm. wrong. Um, so I think maybe I should kind of circle back to that and maybe just kind of give some general advice for all you wrestling coaches that are listening right now. You know, I get asked a lot about like, hey, what is you know, what's the philosophy behind your training or what, you know, what training methods do you follow? And I, I pull a little bit from everything, you know, mm -hmm. we have a powerlifting base. We do a lot of functional stuff that I've come up with. You know, my conditioning based stuff is all, you know, geared around a running schedule or my, my sled protocol. I kind of got a lot of that stuff from Westside Barbell. But if I had to kind of like name the pillars of it, number one is you've got to lift heavy year round. If you want your guys to be strong, you know, late in the season, you'll come to state tournament then you can't spend your weight room days, which are probably very few, maybe twice mm -hmm. a week or whatever, in December and January and February, just doing a bunch of circuits of light weight. I know that that's kind of been ingrained in most wrestling coaches' head. And even the way I trained wrestlers when I first started, that's how I trained them because that's how we grew up training. The idea is like, well, you got to build your endurance. And yes, you can build muscle endurance that way, but your strength workouts need to be for strength. There's better ways. That's why I like to use a lot of the functional training with bed balls and sleds and rope climbs and stuff like that. That's the type of stuff we build local muscle endurance with. And then your conditioning work should be separate. So what that means is if you're going to do, let's say, sprint work because you're trying to get them faster or you're trying to help build their speed endurance, if you're trying to do that after your wrestling practice when they're already dead tired, it's the wrong time. You're not going to get out of it what you're trying to get out of it. So always think about – all right, if my guys are lifting today or if they're conditioning, what is the goal of our workout? Are we trying to get stronger? Are we trying to build endurance? Are we trying to do conditioning? And let that kind of dictate when you do the training and what you do. Now, that doesn't mean you can't do sprints after practice. Just know at that point, it's not really sprint work. They're just mm -hmm. kind of running fast. And, yes, it's still conditioning, and that's fine. But just remember that you have to have kind of the goal in the session for my, the, in mind, and then you have to kind of program it accordingly. So – Again, I, I, I could talk about this stuff all day. No, but no. They've got, to, they've got to lift heavy year round. That is the biggest thing. Just make sure as you get into the season, the volume changes. That, you know, now we're not doing a ton, a ton of sets and a ton of exercise for each muscle. You know, your lifts should almost be kind of full body. They might come in and deadlift and do a split squat and do some type of press. And then maybe they're doing their functional stuff with rope climbs and medicine balls. So, but on those heavy compound lifts, you've got to lift heavy year round. Boom. Gotcha. Go. Gotcha. Any, any, uh, any favorite so social media follows or any recommendations of who I should have on the show? Well, I, number one, if you don't already, which I, I guarantee everyone's listening right now, you got to follow my man, Highlight Humphrey, right. you know, just right. watching the stuff he does is awesome. Plus he's a super motivating guy. So he's a great guy to follow. Um, Vicky Vortex, you know, Victoria mm -hmm. Anthony's probably one of my other favorite athletes to follow. She's another like inspiring individual. She's always working hard. Her personality, she's upbeat. She's a great one to follow. Um, as far as for wrestling, you know, technique, I mean, obviously there's a million accounts out there to follow. Mm. I really like my guy, you know, uh, Cliff Fretwell, Narkill. Yeah. He's yeah. a great follow. This guy, I love that dude. He's, he's hilarious. He kind should of, have him on like, next week, actually. He, he was supposed to be on last week. Really? So. Yeah, we bring him up here. Uh, bro, he was just actually up in Cleveland last week, but uh, uh, brought him up Sandusky a few times, so. He's, he's okay. a good time. He's a good time. Great, dude. So, yeah. 
those are the three guys, three mm -hmm. people you should follow on IG. I don't want to say guys, Vicky Vortex and, right. you know, Reese and Narkill. And yeah, definitely, uh, I, would, I would reach out to, I know Reese and Vicky are getting ready to start a, a joint podcast together, which would be really cool. Oh, but, cool. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Maybe, maybe you could, uh, you know, get them on here and maybe, you know, go in there and talk about what it's been like to build a, a youth state tournament here in the state. I think it'd be kind of a cool thing to talk uh, about. With touch. Uh, so do you train, uh, you know, women wrestlers a little different? Do you train any women or I guess suggestions you have with that, with uh, that growing? So that, that's another question that I get a lot from coaches. They'll, you know, they'll say, Hey, I have your off season program. How do I need to change it for my female wrestlers? And I'll say, you don't. You know, the strength mm -hmm. and energy demands are the same in women's wrestling as it is in men's wrestling. So I don't really recommend, um, you know, training the women any different. Now, there are certain things like typically women train, tend to be a little bit more quad dominant. So what that means is you might – that's why you see a lot, like especially like in girls' basketball, a lot of knee injuries because maybe their hamstrings are weak. So when they do a lot of jumping, they end up getting knee injuries. I don't know if this is the case in women's wrestling. I mean, I know we have knee injuries across the board in men's and women's wrestling, but I, I would just kind of be cautious, really making sure that you prioritize the hamstrings. Um, but I recommend that for all wrestlers. Um, okay. Obviously, you know, weight cutting, which I am not a fan of, and I don't mm -hmm. endorse anyway, but weight cutting is going to be a little bit different with females because their hormonal cycle is going to be different. Mm -hmm. But I feel like that is probably something that, you know, they should be consulting – with their doctor with, you know, mm -hmm. as opposed to their, their strength coach or their wrestling coach, they should really get their diet into, which I, again, I recommend all wrestlers so that it's not, you know, cutting weight, but that we're bringing our body fat down in a healthy manner gradually. Right. Uh, optimizing the body, not cutting things yes, out. Right. Absolutely. Right. That's what I try to tell my kids. They don't, they don't get it sometimes, but uh, my wrestlers, <laughs> not my, my own kid, not my own kids, but my wrestlers. So, right. so no, thanks for joining us. Uh, I appreciate the time. Uh, definitely very insightful and uh should be a good show so thank you awesome man. i appreciate you having me on and you know me man anything you need i'm always here for you I, Any much, you guys much appreciated yeah man yeah hey every once in a while you'll you'll reach out and you have a question i always like catch you at like 7 a.m when i'm driving to work or something like hey you got a minute you're like yeah, of course i got a minute so yeah. just you know always enjoy the back and forth with you for sure and i'm always here to help so with that being said any of you other coaches that are listening if you follow my Instagram account, if you follow my Facebook account, I always answer all of my messages. And anytime I get DMs with questions, I always make sure I reach back out and help you guys. I post a ton of content that will give you guys resources. And then if you need some guidance and you want to be able to see what my athletes do and have a plan to follow, you can get my eBooks at oldschoolgym.com. And I'm going to have a real big announcement coming up in December starting in January 1. I can't really tell you exactly what it is, but I'm going to say it is going to be the best resource for wrestling coaches in the world starting January 1. Be ready for it. Nice. Thanks. Thanks, coach.